So tonight is really a great night, and um, you know, with uh, with Linda and Lori as our presenters. So I'm, I'm thrilled about that. Um, but tonight we're going to start with Max Hirschfeld speaking a little bit about what he's doing for the Ukrainian cause. And if you have um, uh, you have any questions, you can ask Max tonight. You can put it in the chat room, or you can contact him. Uh, we'll be dropping in. You, you'll see his. Um, his website of what he's doing for the Ukraine, uh, re Ukrainian population, um, you know, as they battle through this war. Uh, so I'm going to let Max take over for the moment. It's all yours, Max. Thanks, Frank. Um, I appreciate this. I'm going to be really quick. This will be the photographic version of the 32nd elevator pitch. And I hope everybody um, is healthy tonight. Um, I'm here as one of the co-founders of imagesforhumanity.org. Um, and in February of last year, an old friend of mine, Andy Anderson, who's a tremendous photographic talent, lives in Idaho, reached out to me and David Burnett and, and Arthur Meyerson to say that he hoped we could do something uh, in response to the uh, invasion of Ukraine. So in short order, we put together a organization, again, imagesforhumanity.org, and it's a donation platform where for um, a, a modest donation, you can get a fine art print uh, from uh, over 100 what we call world-renowned photographers. So uh, I'm here just to uh, let everyone know that the organization is alive, the platform is well. Um, we're doing a, a sort of a, a push now because it, it would make a really um, uh, interesting gift for somebody. And I hate to put it in those terms, but there are a lot of um, people whose names you may recognize. And I won't take up time sharing the screen now for the website, but it is on the chat. And um, there are um, dozens and dozens and dozens of photographers' names there who you will know. Um, Herb Ritz Foundation, Mary Ellen Mark, Mark Seliger, Albert Watson, um, on and on and on. And there's some spectacular images. So all the prints are eight by 10. They're printed on donated paper from Moab. And they're printed by a lab in Missoula, Montana, um, called Paper and Ink. And they were just awarded the Lucy Award for the best lab in the country. So you can be assured, should you choose to make a $125 donation for this print that you will be, it'll be super high quality. So I'm here just to let everybody know that this is alive and well, and I hope you can take five minutes to visit the, the site. Great, great. Um, well, Max, you know, I know everyone appreciates the effort. Thank you. Doing that. And I encourage everyone to go there. You know, nobody is more noble and um, forthright than Max Hirschfeld. So um doing that yeah. is great and you get a fine art print you know as a byproduct that's that's really terrific thanks everybody thank i appreciate you. it i'll post my in the chat room i'll post my personal um email address if anyone has any questions and thanks and good luck um to linda and to laurie great um so tonight um i want to thank our sponsors which is uh pro photo daily photo shelter american photography archive magazine and Epson, Epson um, helps us out, you know, throughout the year. Uh, and we have two, you know, friends of mine for a long time. And you know, Lori holds a special place for me as probably, uh, you know, I'd have to do the math on it. But the biggest job I've ever gotten in this industry in over 30, in, in in thirty years. So Lori, Lori uh, will always be looked upon as the uh, as the Citibank lady. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and we love her for that. Um, so tonight we have Lori Grinker, and we start off with the great lady of our industry, Linda Troll, who will be talking about her exhibit at the Museum of Sex. So Linda, we get you to share your screen, and off we go. Also, while she's doing that, I encourage everybody, and we'll put it into the chat room to subscribe to our. YouTube channel. Uh, when you can, Jay will, Jay will put that link in there. So, Linda, it's all yours. Yes. Uh, good evening. I'm happy to be here and uh, to talk about a show. <clears throat> it's called Self Power 
self-play, 50 years of erotic photography. And it's at right now at the Museum of Sex until January 9th. <clears throat> so it's wonderful that, uh, that this talk tonight is timed with being able to give you a little bit of a preview. Um, so the way the show came together is that <clears throat> there's a collection of my self-portraits at Bryn Mawr College and uh, Emily Scheuer and Emily Alessandri are PhD students there and saw this work <clears throat> and it was eventually to be a show there, but it hadn't happened yet. And so they got, one of them worked at the Museum of Sex and said, let's see if we can get this together. And um, they came over to my studio, looked at my work, looked at my books, evaluated it. And you know, the show became something more than self-portraiting. It had to be more for a museum of sex and have that many sexy self-portraits. So um, we looked at really how I had over a career taken a lot of pictures of women. And so the show is organized um, by mood, by uh, connections, by visual connections, by, um, by from different aspects of how um, the erotic and the sensual can be captured. So um, we'll just start with the first wall <clears throat> here. This is Amanda Lepore, and I photographed her when I ran, ran around at the Chelsea Hotel, uh, Suzanne Barsh party scene. And um, I love this picture of her. Um, and then the picture next to that is my Chelsea hotel room where I lived for 20 years. Um, that's my, actually turned out to be my husband on the bed. Yep. Above me is a, an a Andres Serrano picture. I was supposed to be in his America book as the <laughs> mother, uh, a weeping woman, but um, it didn't make it, but it made it on my wall. And then it just show me at 24 at the top by David, um, David Bales, and then another in 2004 that Lota took of me. And then to the other side of that is a picture by Alana Kundi, who came to do an assignment for Village Voice about me and made her own pictures. And then she used this picture as her like leave, leave behind card at the Eddie Adams workshops. And like everyone I ran into said, I've just seen you, I've just seen you. <laughs> of course they just saw me. So that was sort of fun. So this is how the gallery looks <clears throat> and it's really splendid space. Um, so on the left side, you see this earlier work that kind of goes around and in the back room is the healing waters work and so sort of takes you through. Um, and Lynn, how long is the show up for? It's open until January 9th. January 9th, okay. Of the whole holidays to get moving before the parties. Um, anyway, once you get in the space, working with this wonderful team at the Museum of Sex, we came up with the idea of having some of the images also on uh, silk so they could flow in the space. And then they have a machine where we were able to print on vinyl. So these pictures of my body, I like feel like skins, so it's a pretty neat thing. But that's all you get to see for now. Um, now, you, how is it that I am an erotic I use this kind of way of seeing. So I want to <clears throat> I want to talk to you a little bit about my backstory. Even in my youth, I knew my mother lacked fulfillment, as my father's sexuality was compromised from war injuries. I saw that when she was out of sorts with her body, she lost self confidence. That loss of serenity was devastating to my mom in her prime, and observing this, probably subconsciously affected me. When I was three years old um, was probably when I had my first orgasms and it was with the neighbor children. Um, they all, we all got in a circle and they said, okay, we pull our pants down now. And, um, you know, I was of course shame. I felt a little shame, but right away I knew this is a feeling I wanted to know more about. So um, I invited my girlfriend's over and I, we would play doctor and I would say, oh, can you touch me with shells? I mean, I, I was really into it. And my mom, my parents, did, my mother would say, it's a peach ice cream time. 
she kind of knew what was going on, but um, never made me think that uh, we'd say, we'll be there in a while, you know, because we were having fun. So I very early had this um, tempting interest. Also, um, as a young woman, I was very photogenic and I was queen of a lot of proms and I had a lot of fights with people over it. Um, but uh, I, the feeling of having myself crowned, you know, really juiced me up with this sensation. So um, that is sort of in my system and my dance teacher, Lillian Dean wanted to take me um, to be Miss America. So um, here's what happened. It was 1967 and all my friends were into Joan Baez and Bob Dylan. And it was time for me to say, no, I'm not going that direction. So I said to my parents, well, uh, the Presbyterian Church is having this big conference center in New Mexico. Can I go there then next summer? And they said, well, yes, okay, that's a church. You can go there. So <clears throat> I became an assistant at the um, Ghost Ranch Center where um, just by chance, one of the directors at the event gave me a camera um, just that day. And, and that happened to be the day that we had the official lunch at Georgia O'Keeffe's house. And as soon as I walked in and munched a little bit, um, she opened the portico doors and said, you must go outside and see what the spirits tell you. Well, they told me over that summer that I'm not going to be a lawyer to defend my parents, that I'm going to be and go back to school and be a photographer. And I made my first self-portrait. Look, I already took off my top. So um, that's just where things were rolling for me. And then the next year, um, I got to be the assistant uh, at the Ansel Adams um, or Yosemite bookmaking workshop, which was the thing to do back then. Um, which I enjoyed. I met George Tice and Ralph Gibson and worked and whatever. But then they, one of the directors said, you know, the next landscape is nude in the landscape and um, we're missing a model. Do you think you could stay another three weeks here? I was like, of course I can. Um, although a, a part of me wondered, will that affect my photography career? Um, so here I am with Lucy and Clarig and the other models. And it was an extraordinary experience. I also, became a model for Lucien in other workshops. And I'm in his book called Nude Workshop. This is Point Lobos, a beautiful area that we both fell in love with. I mean, he was always very fond of Edward Weston's mythology. So um, moving on, I had, had my camera with me and I did make one memorable picture here, which I call homage to Tina Madati during this time frame. Then I went back to school to finish my MFA. And now <clears throat> we're in the period of women's liberation. This is the seventies and um, things are not so easy for women. And so I decided to do a project called Greenhouse and Beyond and bring women to greenhouses and bring objects and swords and things like that. So I also brought with me a cutoff wedding dress. And my th thought was that I'm just not going to be a normal woman. I'm going to figure something out. And this model just jumped up and this cactus just jumped out. And I said, oh my God, that is all the male aggressors. That's all the male curators. They're the people that's so hard for us to you know, make our way. This picture is that. So um, in this portfolio of 12 pictures, um, there are a couple of nudes. And this one was so important that it made it into the Village Voice, which at that time was about this thick, and you just didn't go to New York without looking at the Village Voice. So that was a big thing for me at that time in my career. And then also Heresies was a collective that did incredible women's rights books, and it was published there. So that part of my life um, was good, but uh, I had a terrible breakup. Uh, my engagement was off, and I, again, uh, the day books were still bigger for us. So I said, I have to go to Mexico. And I wrote to Lenora Carrington and uh, she lived in Mexico City. She's a surrealist painter and I liked her very much. And she said, yes, you can visit me. And I visited her and she said, you know, here in Mexico, we heal people. You will either take the mushrooms or you will go to a hot spring. You will, you will not um, 
you know, stay ill here in Mexico. So I went off to San Jose, Peru, this is here, for five days and into the mineral waters. And um, it was here that the Indians, uh, <clears throat> the indigenous Mexicans actually, you know, showed me how to bring the mineral water to my face and let it absorb and let the tears and the sadness fall away. Well, this started me out on my next project, which was falling in love with water and sensuality of water and the sexuality of water, trying all different ways to explore water. Um, this is Harbin Hot Springs. It still exists, a famous place where they made underwater massage and all kinds of experimentation. So where anything I, I could find about water, I took pictures and I continued with my self-portraiture along the way. And then of course, I wanted to have a couple in the water. Um, and um, they all look like they were at the Poconos bed, you know, with the love circle or something. So um, I burned this slide and this is very successful. It's in a number of collections. Um, Anyway, I just kept pursuing this kind of vision and eventually it came together as a book with Michael Sand was the editor with Aperture. And it was a wonderful time for it. It was just the beginning of everybody being more conscious about their, their bodies. And I had a, a show in the beautiful former Aperture building. So um, just to sort of add in the exhibition, uh, uh, they continued to a few of my pictures because I, it's like a personal project. Water is still something that I am attracted to photographing. In fact, I photographed this in Hot Springs, Arkansas. It was my first assignment out of COVID. And um, I entered it into the International Photo Awards. It was a finalist, it didn't win, but um, it just was really my subject. So here is how it is presented at the gallery. Um, there's a picture of me on vinyl on the wall floating, and then pictures that have to do with floating or floating or sexuality, for example, to the right is, <clears throat> is dragonfly. And her first orgasm um, was in the shower when her mother kept saying, why are you in the bathroom so long? What's going on with you? So um, there- Wait, Lynn, Lynn, ju just a question. Like, when like or, or what does it feel like when all of a sudden water you recognize as something that is drawing you in you know like how does that how does that happen to you you know mentally and physically like wow i found something that really drives me really motivates me really opens up a creative space that i i never felt before what does that feel like it totally gave me a totally changed my life. I mean, I was depressed, this boyfriend, everything was planned, everything was wrong. And, and you know, being in the waters for that week um, and being, you know, you have a, a, a waiter, waitress, someone working with you, um, you know, truly um, that changed my life. And, you know, today you can buy mud, but back then I even brought the mud, you put the mud over your body. I actually bought it home in a jar. I was so transformed by that. I mean, you know, it was just done. I mean, as soon as I had that healing, I knew that it would be my project. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't easy. There were no guidebooks. I mean, I had to really search at libraries and to find out about hot springs. So it, it, it yeah, it just, Taught me, and besides, I saw people getting better. And also, I was working on this during uh, a little bit of the AIDS era. Also, so I also have another body of work called the TB AIDS Diary. And so, you know, I was also looking for places where people could be healed. So, yeah, it, it just um, let me show you. So here, at the other side is uh, the other pictures. But these were the pictures that the, the museum creatively, when you go to the show. These are rather recent pictures. It's a slide, I, I can't do it for you here, but it's all blended together on a pod on the, on the ground in that space. So, um, you know, there are just so many aspects of what are the sexual aspects, the healing aspects, the visual aspects. Um, and, you know, you get deep into a project, but then 
um, Marion Schneider invited me to take pictures of a new kind of healing that was called liquid sound, underwater light and sound. And so um, I went to see her about that. But just before that, <clears throat> um, Jeannie Adams, Ansel's daughter, called me and said, we have this opportunity. Would you like to be uh, Annie Leibowitz's assistant for a week here at Yosemite? We know you. And, uh, you know, it didn't work out with someone else, but you're across the United States. But if you want to come, and I said, well, that would be amazing. And so I spent a week, uh, you know, shifting from other kinds of ways of being to learning more about environmental portraiture with her. And, um, but this is the picture that I ended up making of myself there with my SX-70, with the smallest flower possible in the biggest park with everything going on. This is, you know, still trying to find that central vision. Um, this, and of course, this is the lead picture that was chosen for the show. So what that did was um, gave me a segue to talk to my friend about the fact that I had some other traumas in my life and I was very interested in women and what made them, what made them tick and what made me tick and what could make me stronger. So Mary and I put our heads together and we made a book and I got the book deal from, um, with a proposal from Scalo and a Zurich company. Um, so we decided to ask people, women, what was your first erotic experience and can you show it to the camera? And what was your strongest erotic experience and can you show it to the camera? And then um, Marianne recorded what they had to say and I had to make a creative picture given the situation. As I said, I lived in a built -in, uh, art world living at the Chelsea. So this happened to be Maria on the sixth floor but she was one of our first people. What was your strongest experience? Well, this being, you know, I guess having less air, you know, is really thrilling and can really excite you erotically. And this was her dildo collection, which today you can just buy on the internet, but in the nineties, that was really quite something. So I began, I didn't always in my work include myself. That was a really powerful erotic idea to, um, present myself. And um, from this book, this is Valerie. And um, I think it was very helpful to uh, be able to learn about this aspect of yourself because Valerie um, really went through a depression when she gained a lot of weight during um, menopause uh, around her waist and she didn't feel good about herself, but she learned about these stockings and wearing a camisole and she, you know, so she tells her story about, you know, really the strongest experience was when she actually saw herself, rebuilt herself, rebuilt her, her self-esteem. So um, there's not <clears throat> so much time, so I will just move up further, was that this book, I got a phone call and invited to lunch by the New York Times book review editor and he said we're going to be doing a story on you we've already assigned Susie Bright uh, to write about it we love this book and, uh, and I had a wonderful lunch and he said you'll be in the you'll be you'll be in the New York Times book review next week probably and I, I called my my publisher and he said oh a fat day and whatever that'll be in that magazine and sure enough on next Sunday um, this was in the New York Times magazine uh, uh, section and um, she said that it was one of the gutsiest books of the decade. And the next day I had a, an assignment at a doctor's office. And when I went in, I said, my name was in patrol or was there to photograph something. They said, oh my God, we read about you yesterday. You know, um, it's a different world now, right? So we want to move on uh, my time. Oh, wait, wait, so Lynn, I mean, when a, moment, when, when a moment like that happens, yes. right? You're in the doctor's office and now all of a sudden you're you're a star. How, I mean, how did that make you feel? Yeah, it was really um, 
exciting. I mean, the way the way you said it, they were, it, they were, they were like gorgeous. They were gorgeous. It was a plastic surgery. The assignment was for Spa Magazine, and it was it was you know, and I had to take pictures, you know, sort of bloody stuff that they do back then, and and I'm in there trying to work it out, and they're all talking about me. The office is crowded with people. And they wanted to go get the somebody that said they had they thought they had the newspaper, and um, I said, wow, that really works when when you're out there. You know, and the doctor was like, wow, you know, they're like, what do you, what do you want? What do you want me to do? Change your face or you know, something? No, but it was very, very exciting. Yeah. I mean, that's one of those things where like it, it never gets old, right? To get, you know, some type of proof in the public that I'm doing something right. I'm doing something that's provocative. I mean, the way you described it is like it happened yesterday. That's so nice. <laughs> Yeah, and you know it doesn't happen all the time. So uh, that was <clears throat> you spend a lot of time alone, a lot of time, you know, with your work, and and that happens. It really gives you a a rush. Yeah, a rush. Um, so the second book, <clears throat> Marion and I wanted to go deeper into sexual exploration, and um, I wanted to fight the um, you know I changed the idea. Of, masturbation and stuck with pornography and things like that. Um, way off my schedule here. Um, so what happened was we um, we did the same thing again. What was your first orgasm and can you show it to the camera? And what was your strongest orgasm? And we recorded the answers. Well, a funny thing happened. We really didn't anticipate that nobody was really, you know, we didn't like put an ad and say you want nudity or labias or vaginas and all that stuff. So we ended up working with people who kept their clothes on and just, you know, recreated an idea. And so, um, you know, for me, it was many little things, but probably pine needles. And that was pretty easy for Marion to photograph. And then I interviewed her and she had an orgasm much later, uh, uh, you know, after a bunch of beers at college, she ran into the toilet and realized she needed to have an um, experience. People didn't talk about it a lot, but um, this is Miss Amelia, who also happened to live at the Chelsea. I had like a ready, ready group of models there. But um, for her, her first experience was, um, you know, in, with the sheets rubbing against her, rubbing herself all against the sheets. And this is um, Sophia, and <clears throat> Sophia's from Portugal. We tried to have women from different places, and Sophia said her strongest orgasmic experience is the aphrodisiacness of the sun. So there I am in this little hotel room, and I had to figure it out. But luckily, the sun came in, and I saw that that fake. It's, it's, it's plastic plastic face on her but I mean it, it just like she just went into it you can see that she's feeling it that was the point and so here we are at my exhibition and Sophia is now a PhD she's a, um, a doctor of gender studies of literature and of film and she flew in from Berlin to support this work in fact five people flew in from the one woman being in my orgasm book changed her life so much that she wrote her story about the abuse of her father to her, which is just uh, out in, in um, Dutch, I guess. Um, so it was pretty amazing. And I want to thank Grace and Dantic, who, who is an event photographer who has spoken before and is an artist, to have sent me this picture from the event. Um, I just have a little bit more. So uh, this is Annie Sprinkle. Many people have heard of her because she is uh, an uh, installation artist. She is sextress. She's had over 10,000 physical experiences, she says, in one of her lectures. Um, anyway, well, she had to be in my orgasm book. So um, her first orgasm was with a young man by the sea. So we had to recreate these feelings and people really stare at this. I don't know, they think she's communing with the earth or whatever it is. I was really surprised It's one of the ones when you stand around your show, you're surprised what people like. And um, so <clears throat> this is um, a dragonfly in the middle um, and behind her is dragonflies 
strongest orgasm, which was, she was choking. And this, the woman in the jumpsuit is Emily Scheuer, the main curator of the show. And that's me talking um, at the opening. And um, you see the reason why these people made efforts, she came all the way from Brooklyn, but make, make efforts is they're going out in the world. They're attracted to my topic. They're attracted about doing things for women. So, you know, we stay in touch with each other. We have so much to do. And now, um, of course, at the Museum of Sex, it's not on the first ground floor. You have to buy a ticket and go up and see this museum. And my show is at the top. So I got this surprising email the other day. And I think this friend describes my show very well. Her name is Paula Allen. And uh, were contemporaries. Uh, she photographed women in Chile and women in Cuba. I haven't seen her in a long time. And I get this email and it says, Dear Linda, in your exhibit at the Museum of Sex, you have been photographing in the realm where sexuality is not something out of ourselves, but it is us. It is our desires, our imagination, our right. Seeing work that spans so many years and is so gorgeously and lovingly presented is a pleasure. Photographs of pleasure presented in pleasure. So beautiful. A big congratulations. I would not have missed it. And I think that's another one of those aha moments. Like we yeah. just that. So um, I'm going to go on a little bit further just a few more minutes. Um, I wanted to say that this exhibition has gone full circle. Um, full circle A, meaning that's Frank, who popped into my opening. And just doing opening. research, just doing research for my protection. I couldn't resist. And Dr. Marina Masick, who's been a real supporter of, you know, all the hard parts of working with were, uh, ideas that are taboo. So, um, Anyway, this gallery space last year was a show of Betty Dodson. Betty Dodson ran a masturbation workshop for 50 years in New York City in her loft and she made art and showed around the city. Unfortunately, she died before her, sh her show, but um, it was an amazing show. I, I went to it. And what a circle is that in the 80s or 90s, I bought my mother a ticket or a ticket and an invitation to go to a loft event where you explore yourself with Betty Dodson and how to feel more comfortable with your sexuality and your masturbation. And my mother, my mother didn't go, but she received the Betty Dodson vibrator in the mail. And my mother used that vibrator until she died at 89 in a nursing home. And you know, what I said before about she missed out on knowing how to be in touch with her body. But um, maybe that's one of the lessons of my show. I'm, I'm sure it is. Um, because my goal has always been to try to make a picture that makes my goosebumps on my spine or my eyes quiver or sensual. I mean, I use everything. I use color, I use sex, emotions, clothing, anything I can to make picture in this theme. So I'm going to read the final quote for, the, for my talk, <clears throat> which um, Jerry Saltz, the uh, great critic wrote for the back cover of my book. It says, I firmly believe that women's mysteries when explored by artists will change the way the world looks and the way we look at the world. You all have the power, you only have to decide what to do with it. And this show is something I decided to do, and it was a huge amount of work. I have to thank my husband, Lota Troller, and everyone that contributed to make this beautiful space. And uh, my final words are, I hope that the takeaway from this lecture and when you go to see the show are, let go of shame, aging justice, and expand your bodily health, your awe, your sensibility. We've been all tied down in COVID. And this is certainly a, a time um, that my work is needed. Great. 
And that show is up until January 9th, right? Yes. Great. It's 27th and 5th Avenue. 22nd. 27th. 5th Avenue. It's easy to get to. And then you can go to Eagley and have a nice meal. Yeah, there you go. Great, 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 great. All right. So, um, Linda, you stop sharing. Oh, let me finish off with the last. Okay. One. So this is the last picture that Marina took, and you can see it was a wonderful evening, and there was a lot of fulfillment in the room. That's what I felt. People felt really good. Yeah, I have to say, it's really a great presentation to show us the gallery show as you go through your work. It really is a terrific way to present. So really, really very, very nice. Thank you. Very, very nice. Um, so um, stick around. We'll, I'm sure people will have questions on the back end. Uh, and if you look into the chat room, Lynn, you'll see um, everyone's loving, you know, loved your presentation. So, you know, look through there. You can answer, you know, some of those, um, uh, those comments there. So now we'll ask you to stop sharing. That was really great. Thank you, Linda. Um, now we have Ms. Lori Grinker, who's going to present uh, work from her latest book uh, on Mike Tyson. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, let me now share my screen. Hopefully I'm on the right one. Yeah. Uh, hang on. Okay. Yeah, right there, Laura. You're great. Okay. So um, when I was a student at Parsons School of Design, I took a photojournalism class. I was painting and drawing and wanted to be an illustrator or be in communication design, but I took had taken photography um, before that with Harold Feinstein at a liberal arts college in Vermont. And at Parsons, I took class. I studied printing with George Tice. I had workshops with Lisette Modell and Bernice Abbott and, you know, some classes with some other people. But this was my only photojournalism class, my only journalism class ever. And um, we had to try to find a story and try to get it published. We had to find a story and try to get it published by the end of the semester. And I had learned about these kids upstate New York in Catskill who were living in this house with custom auto and training to be boxers. Uh, there was Nadia Houston, I can never say her name right. She's on the far left. And Billy Ham, who's on the far right, standing on the chair. But uh, Laura, when you say you had to find out and you heard about, like, how did you really find out about this kid? I, um, the, the new school had been, had a seminar about, Maham, about uh, uh, sorry, the new school had a, a class, Filmmakers on Filmmaking with Richard Brown. And, and he asked if I would take pictures for it because I guess they put out a notice for a photography student or something. I don't remember how it happened. And so I got to photograph all these people, you know, lots of directors and actors came in and, and um, so they decided to do a, another seminar and that was about Muhammad Ali. So they asked if I wanted to take pictures of that. And one of the guests was Jim Jacobs, who was um, the owner, co-owner of a fight film company and archive called The Big Fights. And he um, co-managed some fighters and he supported Customato in this house. So I heard him talking about it. We were in the green room and I was photographing him and I'm like, you know, I have to find a, I have to do this story. Can I go up there and photograph? And, and he asked Customato and Cus said yes. And I went. Mm -hmm. And I was very interested in the girl who was a Mormon and had a pet, a white rat as a pet. And the elders were there doing their like door to door. And so it was very visual. And there was Billy Ham, this tiny little kid with muscles who has to stand on a chair to reach the speed bag. And he lived in a trailer and he stayed at the house on weekends. And so I did stories on both of them and actually sold the story of Billy Ham to a magazine called Inside Sports, which was um, 
you know, Newsweek companies, you know, Sports Illustrated was brand new and they actually test marketed a cover so that, you know, I was a college student and I had this cover. I'm sorry, I don't have that picture here. Um, and then I started working. I dropped out of school actually. And, and um, I interned at the Village Voice and I was trying to st- sell these stories and um, story about Mike and people didn't know what, you know, they didn't think I knew what I was talking about and all this, but, um, but I, w- I was up there and I would stay sometimes on the weekends and the gym was on top of the police station, still is actually in Catskill, New York. So you can see Billy standing there. And um, so I, you know, I was just learning and like going back to the first picture, how do you go back? It won't let me go back. It won't even let me go forward. Hold on. Oh, maybe I'm not on it. Okay. Uh, This picture, this is like one of the first pictures I took. And it's one of my favorite pictures. And Mike is 14. And, you know, I just went up there shooting and I would develop my film. And I was pretty um, bad at developing film. Some of the negatives are terrible (laughs) now that I'm printing them for exhibition. Um, And it was just really interesting, you know, Cus was always teaching and um, I was actually learning how to use a flash here. That was one of the things we were learning in that class. Um, I would have shot a little slower and gotten more ambient light in it if I was a little more advanced. Um, Oops. And uh, so Cuss lived with Camille. They lived in this big Victorian house in Catskill, New York. And and the guy on the front left is Frank. And then Camille, who was Cuss's partner, but they weren't really public about it because apparently the, from mob related things, but I don't know all those details. Teddy Atlas is sitting between them and he was the trainer. And then there's Billy and then there's Mike. So the, the, these photographs also represent sort of a period piece for you as it relates to you learning your craft. Yes. And, um, you know, I, I was doing actually this other series that was more fine art where I was photographing men in these poses, some nude and um, one shared a dark room with the dark room that I used to use that was in the West thirties. And, you know, the West thirties was pretty rough back then. And, and so I would stay over the loft and, and um, this guy Warner Wada uh, had a, a slip from divine, the actor divine and Warner had like Warner was Japanese and had hair like down to his knees. And so I was doing all these like, female poses. And I, I want to get to that work and scan it and stuff. But so I journalism or documentary wasn't really what I was planning on doing, but this happened and, and I started working. So, um, you know, but this really is the very beginning of it. So here's Cuss in the living room at night in his bathrobe. And this is a fold out in my book. And it's um, five pictures where he's teaching the kids his peekaboo style. <laughs> and, and Laura, how old are you when you're doing this 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 work? Well, I, I kind of went to school and then would take time off and then would go back. So I was in my early 20s. And and did we know that, did, did you know as you were shooting this that it's about the boxer? Is it about the trainer? Is it about the experience? Like where where was your direction at that time? For me, it was about these kids and what boxing was doing for them and how it was getting them off the streets. And, and, um, you know, it was the whole world that was just so different than my world that I really wanted to get away from. Um, so it just took me outside of myself and into something else. And, and, you know, in the beginning I was trying to get them to stop speaking certain ways with cuss even like trying to bring my feminist ideals in (laughs) they would argue with me and I wasn't going to get anywhere so I just then realized you know I'm not here to to lecture them I'm here to document their lives and and, 
one of my first journalistic uh, lessons. Uh, you know, you see the, the the sign there for the courtroom. That's, I mean, this is literally over the courthouse. That's really amazing. This um, this is somewhere else. Oh, it is okay. Yeah, I forget where, but so they would go to different places, like in Troy, New York, and Albany, and and the Bronx, and meet with other um, groups and fight. And and so there'd be a whole, you know, um, they would talk about the rules first. Maybe this one was in Catskill, but it was above the police. It was in the police station. It wasn't above the court. So I I don't think this was Catskill. Don't confuse me, Frank. Sorry. Um, (laughs) Anyway, you can see Mike here. Mm -hmm. uh, And this is Billy. So Billy is my main focus, really. Uh, and, And so then these pictures would lead to Billy fighting. And those were published. Um, and they would take this van together and they played dollar bill poker in the van. And, you know, they were always laughing and having fun. And it was, it was a really interesting group of people living in this house, you know, being raised by these two elderly people. And so then I started doing portraits and things. So now we're, you know, now my, this is like, those were like 1981, 19, you know, around then this is more 84, 85. Um, And so I would bring lights and try to figure out how to light things and, you know, just do things in the gym up in Catskill. And then as many of you might know, um, so Mike was being trained to be heavyweight champion and then Cus died, and that was really, really hard for him. Um, Cus got him out of this reformatory. Cus and he really loved each other. And I asked Jim Jacobs, who's here, and this is Jose Torres, and this is Bill Caton over here on the right, who was the partner of Jim Jacobs in their fight film business and in managing fighters. And so I asked if I could photograph. He said, yes, I called like the Daily News or the Post. And, you know, this was the first time I was trying to sell pictures like as news, which I probably never did again. Um, and so I I went there and Mike didn't want to be photographed. And Jim had to tell him that it was OK and this was part of it. And so they let me photograph. And I think they published the work. They did publish the work. But like I was up in Catskill and then I had to race back to the city. So I was always going back and forth. Um, and, and what's the time period that you've now spent with Mike? How long is that? Uh, well, this is like 85, 86. So, but it's not like I was there all the time. Right. You know, right. I was doing other things. I, I was, I did a book that my first book was published in 1989 and it was about Jewish women in America. And I'd met this writer, Diana Bletter, who was in graduate school with a friend of mine and she was doing something about Jewish rituals. And I am Jewish, but was raised very secular and didn't know anything. And she told me about the mikvah and I wanted to photograph the mikvah. And um, so I, we started doing feminist interpretations of traditional rituals. So that book I worked on for six years with Diana and we got the Jewish publication society, gave us a nice um, amount of money to do it. And I had exhibits at in different museums and galleries. And um, so I was doing that and I would go to photo editors and show my work thinking I was doing color and black and white and portraiture and, you know, lighting things. And, and they'd, one editor once said to me, if we need Jewish women or boxers, we'll call you. (laughs) And that's, uh, that's Emil Griffin on the right there at the funeral, right? Who, where? This is Floyd Patterson. Floyd Patterson, okay. And this is Jose Torres and Mike and... And, and I'm forgetting his name. And he's buried right in the town of Catskill? Cuss? Cuss, I, I, yeah. Yeah. Um, so kind of the book goes through different, like, uh, segments. So you have, like, the early part at the gym, and then you have training, and then you have him with the titles. It's not really chronological. I mean, it's a little bit chronological. Um, so this is Kevin Rooney who became his trainer. 
um, while Cus was alive and after Teddy at Atlas um, was no longer there. And so it, it, it had to be intriguing for you, Laura, like to see this young boy physically grow into a, a man, right? Like virtually in front of your eyes over, over this period of time, right? I mean, from that, from that young boy to, you know, now, you know, this, this machine. Well, he, he was like a machine then. I mean, he was huge. <laughs> he, when they would go to boxing matches and I, I wasn't at all of them. I was only at a few, you know, when, when he was just starting um, turning pro uh, I mean, before he turned pro, they had to bring like his ID because nobody believed that he was oh, really 14. They couldn't find people to fight with him. They couldn't find sparring partners. Um, so these are sparring pictures. These are at the gym in Catskill. And I knew nothing about shooting sports or action or boxing. It was really hard. And um, so then like this is the group in the kitchen at the house with uh, I'm forgetting that guy's name just now, but um, I just realized he's got money in his hand <laughs> with the boom box. That's a period piece, boy. Yeah. And then there's a section on pigeons, and I'm sure a lot of people know Mike is very involved with pigeons still. And uh, so they had this pigeon coop up at the house. And it was really, really dark in there, as you could see. This picture is not in the book and it's one of my favorites and it's a, one of the large prints in the exhibition. And I just, you know, just going back through the archive, just finding these pictures and now finding that they're my favorite. So you can see the house in the back. Um, but this one was always my favorite. And, you know, I brought lights up in this huge long extension cord to get it to the house. And, and, um, And here he's flying his pigeons. And there was another picture with all the pigeons in the air, but we had to cut pages. So that one, that one left. You know, so it was just all these like things like going to the stores at Christmas shopping. And I, I had a little series of this where he's like dancing, but in the book, you know, I wanted to do a bunch of those little like fold outs and things, but this ended up just being one picture. My, the publisher had given me a contract with like a hundred, pages and we worked up we the book was delayed so much and we kept working on it with my designer Giorgio Bardavale and we ended up having like 250 pages <laughs> and then they were like wait a minute so I had to cut and cut and cut and cut uh so this is Camille and this was another difficult shot for me to figure out because he would watch these fight films in the attic at and it was so dark and I don't remember if I just had one light bulb on or something, but it was really hard to get a balance of seeing something on the screen and seeing Mike. And just the guys in the living room at night. There's, there's someone here, someone here, someone here, someone here, and Mike there. So this is one of his early pro fights, but I think it was like number seven, but it was my first pro fight and it lasted 30 seconds and it was in um, Latham, 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 New York. And um, these are some of my favorite pictures too now. That's my favorite, I love that shot. And that was it, the fight was over. 30 seconds and I just happened to be in the right spot, which is often what happens with boxing. You know, you can't really move around the ring. You just have to stay in your spot. So he's only like 18 there. Yeah, and Laura, I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I know you fairly well. I mean, how was it to, to photograph a violent act like boxing? For you, I mean, you know, I, I don't like boxing, and I didn't like it. And I, I, it was when you see fights with people that are really, you know, in a way, boxing's like chess. I mean, you have to think about your moves and and know what can come next. And uh, it's it's as Mike says, a thinking man's sport. And he really studied and he really took it seriously, and that made it really interesting. 
So, um, and you know, I photographed a lot of war that I was doing also at the same time and after war related things. And that was much tougher than this. And I guess they're somewhat related. So this is the first um, championship fight. And uh, so I just wanted to make this portrait of him and, and Jim and Bill it was kind of goofy, um, but we did that. And then this is the fight with Burbick. And honestly, I, I never had done anything like this. You know, when you go to these fights and it's like thousands of people and celebrities and it's just so electrifying. And, and there weren't any other females photographing. Later on, there was a Japanese woman that was there a lot and she was a boxing photographer. So it was really nice to have her there. But um, yeah, it was, it was a huge learning curve for me. And these aren't great boxing pictures. I mean, the people that are, you could see I got a little bit of the rope in my lens. Um, but you can't move and your your elbows are pressed together and, you know, you can barely move your arm to get to change your film and you have to change your film and make sure that you don't miss something. And it's it's a, a t well, now with digital, it's much easier, but it was very difficult back then. You had an assistant behind you, but I didn't know any of that when I started. And I was lucky because I got to go in the ring after because I was already part of the family. And so there's Don King. And then they went back to the room after and there's a little party with balloons and soda. And he got on the phone and called Camille. So that's him talking to Camille. And at, at this point, would he have called his parents or that was long? His, he didn't have a father. And yeah. um, I think his mother had died by this time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, his sister was still alive and his brother and his, his sister died while I still knew him, um, but his brother's still alive. His brother's a doctor in California. So we did this pose out on the terrace in the hotel. And so then it just goes through some other fights and these are all title fights. So this is Bone Crusher Smith. Even you saying that sounds so fun. <laughs> And Tyrell Biggs, he has a lot of blood on him. And then he's getting ready to fight Holmes and there's Donald Trump and Don King, the promoters, everything was always at Trump Plaza. So Trump was around all the time. When we were cutting pages, I cut a lot of Trump. So that was fun. And do you have any contact with Tyson now, Laura? I mean, Not right you know. now. Not right now, no. So That's Michael as, Spinks. As, as you got more experience um, shooting the, the matches, you know what? What did you learn? Like, I know I can't do this, or I know I, sh you know, I should be here or there. You can't be here or there. You're. You look at these. You see these. No, no, I, I know. And... I'm saying beforehand. Beforehand. Oh, beforehand, I wasn't allowed. Um, like right before, I wasn't permitted to walk with him the way he would walk through. Right. Um, well, you couldn't because you had to be in your spot anyway. Right. But I was able to go back after. Um, I would shoot the fights for the big fights. But everything I did that was outside of that, I did on my own. Right. And um, so I got to own the rights to those pictures and all the fight pictures. We shared the rights. Um, and again, they weren't great sports pictures, but but it was good for their archive. This is Muhammad Ali and, and Don King. I got to have breakfast with Muhammad Ali and I got to photograph Muhammad Ali quite a few times. We got a little friendly and I went to his his um, ranch, ranch his, his place in Pennsylvania. So now he has two titles. And now, you know, all the women are coming out and all the people are coming out and all the 80s gold medallions and clothing is coming. And this is in, in the limousine, but he would never let me go to the parties after. Never, not once. So unfortunately, I 
didn't get to see all of that. And, and that's his call or his uh, his call. call? No, his call. His if it was his manager's call, he wouldn't have been going to those parties. <laughs> right, okay. And and he, this is still up in Hatfield. <clears throat> no, these are Vegas. Vegas now. Okay. Yeah. And this is Beverly Johnson, the model who he dated for a bit. So he was like this shy kid who never thought he'd date. And, you know, he grew up super poor and here he is with diamond watches and, and you know, supermodels. Yeah. And this is in Atlantic City. This is one of the fights and everybody was there. So, you know, I, I went to photograph some of the party. Um, so Madonna and Sean Penn. Ivana Trump and, and Malcolm Forbes, Warren Beatty and Jack Nicholson. I had never done any paparazzi thing before. And it was like really strange because what you do is you they let all the photographers stand at the table for like five minutes and they just talk and do their thing and then they brush you away. And it's just really, really strange. Um, so Jesse Jackson was running for office. So this is Jesse Trump and Don King, and I guess Jesse's cheerleaders. <laughs> well, I mean, what a, like what a whirlwind this, yeah. this experience of, of doing a test, you know, doing I'm going to document this young fighter upstate New York, right? And how interesting that road is. Yeah, it was kind of amazing going through everything and realizing the breadth of work that I had. So now we're back in Catskill and he's got his newspaper and his hot chocolate in the morning. And he starts getting interviewed by local reporters. This picture is really bad light, but I love this picture. I mean, just the outfit. And then he gets a Rolls Royce and we're driving through Catskill in his white Rolls Royce. And he's the hero, he's the local hero. Man, oh man. And this is Atlantic City training for, you know, one of the other fights. So again, it's not sequential, it's like groupings of different things. And the police took us to their firing range and we got to shoot guns. <laughs> Mike at the dentist in Manhattan. So his life, you know, now is completely turned around. He can do whatever he wants. He's he's hugely rich. And so this is a bit later. Uh, in Brownsville. So it took me like two years to get him to agree to take me to Brownsville. And I mean, he, you know, he didn't say yes to a lot of things. And he was living in Manhattan with Steve Lott, who was the co the um, assistant manager. And, you know, or he was training. And so I, you know, if he was in New York and I was in New York and I would go through Steve and see if we could get something done or, you know, but one day he just said, yes, let's go. And we got in the car. I was probably at the apartment photographing him. Steve had all these paintings of Mike around and, and so Mike was there and I did these portraits and then I guess he said, okay, we'll go. So this is all in Brownsville. This is self-portrait of him getting his hair cut. Me, the, I'm the self-portrait, selfie as we call it now. So that's what he did. He would go there to get his hair cut. So, I mean, you really got some incredible access, even, even you know, he's the world champ and, you know, he, he's still, you know, letting you in. Yeah, and, um, you know, Steve is still there and Jim Jacobs is around and, so I'm still part of their their company. You know, I was working for the big fights and, you know, I'm part of the team. But then it's it starts to change, you know. And so Robin Givens comes in and they get married. This is their wedding reception at the Helmsley Plaza. That's his sister who passed away not long after. 
And that's Bobby who got him from the reformatory to Customato, Bobby Stewart. And then we did these portraits up at Catskill, um, like my wedding present, and <laughs> they were fighting between every picture. So they, they had a really volatile relationship from day one. So now we're going to Japan. He's going to train for a fight and he was in first class and I was in business class. And I went up to first class to photograph him and they he was lying on the floor because it was more comfortable for him, but they wouldn't let me take pictures up there. So he would come visit me in business class and we were just talking. So I was just photographing his teeth. <laughs> um, and then we're in Japan, he's training. And so there were all, always all these photographers trying to get in. And I was working for the man, the managers on the American side. And there was a Japanese photographer working for the promoters on the Japanese side. And we could always cross the, the rope. Um, so it was, it was, that was an interesting experience. He loved that the Japanese word for yes is hi. And this guy was on the phone. You can see his phone next to him. And he was always like, hi, hi, hi. So Mike would always be saying hi, 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 and laughing his head off. So this is Konishiki, the, the sumo wrestler from Hawaii. And in the domo or whatever it's called, women were not allowed. And, and Robin and I, got access. So we were like the first to be in there, which was kind of interesting. Um, and Mike was so tiny compared to him. So just running through Tokyo. And so this is when Robin and Mike, you know, they had just gotten married, but they were also going downhill and, and you know, there were things Robin would say to people, but I never like, I never saw any of it. So it, there, there was a lot of um, manipulation going on. And that's the one thing I could really see from when Cus died and all these people started coming in and, and then Jim Jacobs died and then Don King came in. So this is Steve Lott. And, you know, they were always, they were like brothers and. Steve Lott sadly died um, in 2021 in November, but he he was in touch with Mike for a long time uh, and worked for Mike, you know, a few years ago. But you know, Mike Mike's wives tend to take over everything, and different people have different ideas about things, and and they started pushing us out. So I mean, I'm the only one really from the past that's left. Steve was the main one. Um, thank God for Steve, because he helped me like with everybody's all these notes that I never took, all the captions I didn't have, all the people's names I didn't remember. He knew everything. He remembered everything. Paisley. So 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 this is also in Japan. And then Robin and I flew back together and her mother picked us up at the airport and convinced me to go to New Jersey with them to Bernersville to look at this house. And so of course I went cause I could photograph, um, but you're pretty tired after a flight from Japan. And uh, that night Mike called and said, so what'd you think of the house? And, you know, I, I had to say it was, I mean, it wasn't my taste, but it was pretty nice. And so they bought it. So that's when like Robin and her mother were like siphoning money and, and just taking over. And this is um, a picture that I wanted to take. I, I had seen all these shadows in the gym and I wanted to recreate it. So I, I learned about these flute lights and, and I'm really not good at lighting, but I figured this out and I went up to Atlantic City and um, I had gotten assignments. Like I was back and forth all the time with writers doing magazine assignments. And, and uh, so he wasn't coming down and, and Jim Jacobs went up to get him and made him come down and he just didn't want to get out of bed and he was yawning here. 
but we did tons of portraits, tons of different poses. You know, I wanted all the old fashioned boxing poses that like Ring Magazine had that I would print. I would print those pictures for them. That's how I made some money. They, I had boxers all over my little bathroom in my studio apartment in the 80s, the, the, the East 80s. And, and I made like 25 cents a print or something. I would wash them in my bathtub. Um, so this is now more like training stuff. This this is not in the order of the book, but I really liked photographing training. I just, you know, the movement and the poses and the dedication and the discipline. And this is um, before a fight, I guess. So, I mean, you had really complete access for, for this long period of time. It's amazing. Yeah. But, you know, when I think about it, if I went through like how many days or weeks I actually spent photographing, it wouldn't be that much over a period of nine years. Because, again, I was doing my book on Jewish women. I started doing my book After War, which was the effects of war on men, women and children on the front lines. And I was traveling all over the world for that. And that's basically why I stopped. You know, it's like I wanted to do other things. And as like Robin and Ruth and, you know, Don King came in and, and Jim died. And I just, it, it, Mike was so unreliable, um, which he was for everybody. I mean, the biggest sports illustrated and life magazine photographers would, they would lose thousands and thousands of dollars because Mike wouldn't show up for something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my interest wasn't in photographing celebrities or athletes. And I had other things I wanted to do. So yeah, this that, is, but th that's really an intriguing thing. I mean, it's it would be so easy to get caught up in that world, but your desires were so far, you know, going wanting to go somewhere else, you know, with your career that you had the mental stamina to you know leave this celebrity world over here, and, and you know document you know after war, which was in a, which is a phenomenal book, right? I mean, that's um, you know a lot of other people would be tempted to go the other way, being that you had that access. So it's sort of interesting how you, you were able to put that in its own little box. Right, but it also changed a lot. I mean, he lost the title, he, his, you know, he, well, I was long gone by the time he went to prison, but you know, it's, you know, he wasn't the heavyweight champion anymore. I kind of left right at the end there. Right. And so here, this, this is in Atlantic City and this is, um, Trump Plaza, and this is a suite that that Trump gave this guy, Bob Labuti, who was a big, big, big gambler and lost millions of dollars there. And he had racehorses and apparently he was um, had was involved with the mob. And so I would go back again, back and forth on weekends. And here Robin's throwing grapes and he has to catch them. And um, so this is like a sparring partner. These are the security guards. This is Bob Labuti. Bob once gave Mike a like diamond encrusted gold Rolex and he would have all this food on the table and, and he wanted me to give him pictures that I would take of everybody. And if I went, came back another weekend, you know, to bring some pictures and I mean, I would go for the day, you know, and go back and, um, I didn't, he want, He would pay me. He said, I'll pay you. And he always had these big blue tins of Iranian caviar. And I said, no, just give me caviar. <laughs> and I was living in the meat market in Manhattan and I would bring this caviar back and my then boyfriend and I would go on the roof and have caviar. <laughs> Sometimes we'd bring it to a restaurant with us and we would buy, like we instead of bring your own wine or whatever, we'd bring our own caviar and then buy wine. George so, Girl makes good. Yeah, I wasn't a good business person. Yeah. So then, you know, this whole thing happened where Ruth, that's Ruth holding her little dog, just like kind of the wicked witch of the West, um, taking Toto. And um, Mike's wheeling Robin in a wheelchair. And Ruth was on the phone the whole day. And then, you know, Robin had this supposed miscarriage, which I don't believe she was ever pregnant. Um, but that was like the end of them. 
And so the thing about photographing training, especially with someone like Mike, who doesn't show up all the time, um, he would run at dawn and you would have to be out there and he didn't always show up. So every day I would have to go out with all, you know, I'm like on the back of someone's car and there'd be reporters and stuff. And you would just wait till the day that he actually showed up, but you could go four days in a row and he wouldn't show up. And Laura, who's paying you? I mean, are you working for a newspaper or magazine? Well, I did. Yeah. So like I would be there with, as I said, different writers or I just would be on assignments for magazines. So like Stern Magazine, Newsweek, Time, everybody. Okay. So this is after he loses his title. And this is the last pictures I took um, from that period. And this is at HBO Studios. And what was so bizarre to me is that he was not in the worst, he wasn't that distraught or upset or anything, but I guess he figured he'd win again. Um, but he had a black eye and black knuckles and they were just, you know, eating cake. Mm. And all these people were outside taking pictures. I love these guys with the Polaroids. And so that was like the end of me photographing him. But then in 2012, well, one last picture of, um, this is just from my negatives. So I always liked that they were next to each other. So I always printed these together. It's like the two-headed monster. Mm. Um, so in 2012, Spike Lee's people contacted my people and they were doing this Broadway um, one man show of Mike and they wanted to use all my pictures and Mike's wife was like please give them a good deal and you know we'll it was, I was always trading with them but I often like with the previous wife it was like give us pictures and you know I would make an album and get send them pictures and then I'd say I want to photograph you for Sports Illustrated and I'd get an assignment and Mike wouldn't show up mm. so he would get his end of the thing I wouldn't get mine and so here, you know, when Kiki kept calling me and saying, you know, give them a good deal and all this, because Spike Lee has no money or something, um, you know, I hadn't seen him in a long time and I wanted to do this book and I spoke to Kiki about it. And so that was kind of part of like me being a little generous, although it was my agency, Contact Press Images, who was making the deal with Spike Lee's people. But so Rolling Stone asked me to go photograph him in the uh, dressing room. So I he was playing video games and doing other stuff. And, you know, this is one of the pictures I like the best where he's reading his lines. But in we started talking and and I said, I want to do this book. And he said, well, you have to speak to my wife. And I said, I already did. And he said, that's your first mistake. And he was laughing and joking. So he got me to his his agent. Um whose name is David Vigliano, who's known as Big the Pig. And he has all these pigs in his office. Um, so he's in on the joke. Um, he represents like all these celebrities who write these bios, like Willie Nelson and um, what's her name, who was in Three's Company, who had the thigh master thing. And, you know, all that's no. all the books he does. So we were working together and that's how kind of how the book came about. I mean, I could have done the book without them, but that's kind of how it came about. And when, when you saw him after that long period of time, I mean, was it a nice flashback do you get from him? You know, to yeah. Him? Yeah. I was uh, with my then husband and Mike hugged me and, you know, I have pictures of it. It was, yeah, it was really nice. Um, yeah, I, I shot a lot of stuff that that night. Right. Um, yeah, it was nice. So this is uh, <laughs> in the 80s, Mike making fun of me and my smile wearing my glasses. <laughs> okay. And that's the end, I think, yeah. Right, okay. So you can stop sharing. I, I think I just did, right? Yeah, you way. did. You did. Okay. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's great. Everyone, um, yeah, also in the chat room, lo loving, loving all this stuff. Um, 
Yeah, Linda. So, I mean, if you needed to contact Tyson, you could, you know. Uh, through question, yeah. Through, through PR channels. people, through the agent, through, yeah. Great. Okay. Good, good, good. Um, and, you know, as you went through the archive, are there still images that, you know, you're finding now that, you know, oh, God, I wish I, I, wish I had seen that or, you know, you know, sort of bias from what's I mean, into uh, other images you'd like to put in? Yeah, lots. Yeah. Lots. Um, yeah. And there's like the show is small, but um, I think the the show is really well hung. That's, you know, the gallery, Brian Clamp here. I'll put my info in again. Yeah, yeah put that in. Oh, wait, did I do it to everyone? I keep doing it wrong. Hold on. Everyone in the meeting. Okay. Um, so, yeah, there's lots. And and there's stuff of Billy Hammond. There's some other boxers. And I think the pictures are interesting in and of themselves. So, um, you know, the boxing is kind of, you know, homoerotic. And there's pictures that have that kind of feeling. And so... Yeah, I'd like to put some more together, but I'm also working on other projects. Right, right. So, I mean, yeah, it, it's it's a nice um, sort of period piece in a career, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. there you are, right at the peak of the boxing world. Yeah, I mean, I think it really surprised me that putting all my work together showed this breadth of this period of history. And, and um, actually, I'd like to read, there's this guy that... Um, I just, I found him doing research about boxing writers and he wrote this blurb for me and I, I really love it. Um, between 1980, his name is Carlos Acevedo and he's the author of Sporting Blood. Between 1980 and 1990, Laurie Grinker documented the meteoric rise of the most polarizing athlete of our time, Iron Mike Tyson, whose complex operatic persona continues to spellbind America nearly 40 years after his professional debut. The intimate black and white scenes of the early 1980s taken in the scruffy Catskills when Tyson was only a teenager segue to gaudy images of his championship heyday in the neon dream meccas of Las Vegas and Atlantic City, all the while accumulating poignancy with every turn of the page because the viewer knows that the shattering downfall is just around the corner. And that really sums it up for me. That's boxing, right? You, you well, that's, but that's Mike's yeah. life. It's, you know, boxing is, you know, I don't know that much about boxing now. I don't, you know, I've been interviewed so much and these writers think I'm like some boxing expert and I'm learning so much from them, but I don't know who the fighters are now, but there's nobody like Ali or Tyson. Yeah, but that, that period has sort of ended, but you had to be excited like Linda was to get that full page in the times. Oh yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't show that. That was kind of amazing real estate to get. Cause they did one whole page of yeah. the sit up and then some other pictures that was in September. And I, I something's coming out in the New Yorker any day now. Um, but yeah, that was, that was pretty great. Yeah. I mean, like you, you get, you get all that space and you know, of course in the times, you know, they don't pay, but it still makes you feel great, right? You know, that I got a time. Oh, they did pay. Okay, that was good. editorial. You think Jeffrey would let them run that without? No, money? no, I, of course you get something. But <laughs> I couldn't was, buy a house with it, but <laughs> I paid <don't laughs> some bills. I'm listening to a Zoom. I'll call you back. All right, Mariette. Yeah, uh, no, I, I, I know that, but it, it wasn't. Um, it, it, let, let me ask you this. If you didn't get a nickel for it, would you still be just excited, as excited? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's my great. point. And, you know, being in the times is always, wow, I'm still, I'm still doing it. You know, it's great. Yeah, and, you know, when I was starting out, I was working for the Village Voice and the Times. Right. That, those were my, that was my bread and butter for a while. Great, yeah. Well, if anyone has any questions, raise your hand or, or you know, just speak oh. up. You know, any questions to Lori or Linda? Um, for Linda? Yep. Uh, Linda, being in the suburbs of Philadelphia, what what is your exhibit at uh, Bryn Mawr College? Well, I got connected there because <clears throat> they had a, 
Um, Willie Williams mentioned that they had a student collection, um, you know, where students looked at pictures and I wanted my archive is at Syracuse University and I wanted this, but the self-portrait work, I wanted it to go somewhere it would be useful. And mm -hmm. um, what it, it led to was that it, an agreement that um, they would give me a show and a catalog and purchase these pictures. So um, I, I matted them all and there were, there are 60 pictures in the Bryn Mawr collection. Now, are they on exhibit now? No, they're on exhibit, 30 of them are on exhibit at the Museum of Sex and 30 of them are mine. Um, and unless something magical happens um, on January 9th, 30 pictures will go back to them and 30 pictures will come back to me. Oh, but they're not on exhibit at Bryn Mawr College. I think that they might uh, okay. uh, decide to exhibit the 30 pictures that they have are beautifully framed in maple. We made that decision. Um, a big expense was made and it would be wonderful. And you know, they have that library gallery where it originally was supposed to be. So um, I don't know yet, that hasn't been discussed. <laughs> I know, you, I want you to come to the opening. I don't know when it'll be, but it would be a great idea if they did. <laughs> but they did put off my show because of COVID, because of COVID, diversity. There were so many reasons that this other situation came together, which oh, wow. filled, filled the agreement enough. Mm -hmm. And, and Laura, do you have a sh the show up? You know what? What's the latest on on you know the promotion of the book, Lori? Uh, well, my exhibit is up now. It opened uh, a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Uh, Frank, you you weren't in... there, Frank. I guess you were in Florida, Sunny. And <laughs> there's always a way to get it in. There's always a way to get it. In. <laughs> anyway, you. the show's at Clamp Gallery, two forty seven West Twenty Ninth Street, through January seventh. Uh, it's a small little show in the back part. There's two gallery spaces. And um, there's a fly in here. That's weird. Um, and the book is for sale and going. Yeah, it's doing well. Great. And you could buy it from Powerhouse Books, the publisher. Of course, you can buy it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all the other places. You can buy it at Strand. I happened to be in Strand the other day and there was somebody flipping through my book really in, intensely. It was so interesting. And in a situation like that, do you just like a little tap on the shoulder? That's my book, you know? No, I just photographed him. Oh, you did? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. So if, if anyone has any other questions, like I said, now is the time. But I cannot thank you both so much uh, for coming in and doing this. It's, it's a long time coming. To have you and you know it's a standing offer you know you have other work you want to show another book more more work in each of your respective categories we'd love to have you you know that Thank all, you. all you have to do is is call or, or and you're and you're in well uh kudos to frank for doing this and being so dedicated to all of us thank you frank that, that that's um that's the easy part and uh, just in in that context, um, we're, we're going to do another week on um, the Ukraine Russia war in mm -hmm. um, in December. So you know you, you'll you'll see something coming out in the next couple of weeks. Um, but you know that's and you know thanks uh, Max for uh, for coming in and giving us a bit of information. But you two guys are absolutely the greatest, and I and I cannot <laughs> I cannot really thank you enough and. Um, like I said, I, I'd love to have you uh, both back. But what I like to do is give each one of you a minute or so just to close us out with any words of wisdom. So we'll let Linda go first, and then we'll let Lori go. Words of wisdom? Yeah, if you have any. If you you don't have, you know, I mean, in your case, you know, get yourself the biggest dildo. Maybe that, you know. Oh, well, I mean, stay alive, stay vibrant. Yeah. Um you know, just when you think it's not going to come together, you keep piling the things together. And, um, you know, more has come. For example, I talked about living at the Chelsea Hotel. Well, I eventually had to leave when it had three owners and I eventually was evicted in 2013. Um, I went back and made pictures and 
you know, the book came out in 2015, living in the Chelsea Hotel, but there was no Chelsea Hotel, it wasn't opened. So, um, but what's interesting is now it's reopened as a five-star hotel, it'll be nothing like I lived as an artist living there, but it's very special. And um, this year, the Museum of the City of New York is having their first triennial March 10th. And they spent, they visited hundreds of photographers and on the theme of home. And uh, they chose me for home is a haven with my Chelsea hotel pictures. So I had been trying to talk to Sean Corcoran for about nine years. I felt my city, you know, the Chelsea had to be in that collection, you know, and then it happened. So, you know, keep circling. There you go. Laura, you get the final word. Hi, words of wisdom. Uh... I I just think that there's inspiration everywhere all the time and you just have to be open to it. And, you know, we never stop. It's just like natural. You know, I, I stopped doing a lot of assignment work. Uh, I got a little burnt out after doing my war book, even though that was one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. And then I went back to graduate school and I wanted to get back more into my art and um push my storytelling in in a different direction which is the direction i had originally started in and i ended up doing you know i had been doing this project about my family history which was mostly landscapes medium format sure. um it's called dear grinkers and um you know we came from lithuania and and the grinkers are dispersed in south africa and there's a big family of Grinkers going through the war in Ukraine right now. Um, anyway, so, so, you know, it was, it's this other project, but at school, they, they kind of talked me out of doing that, which is probably why I've never finished it, but, and to do something else. And my brother died in 1996 of AIDS and we were very close and I had all his, archives and he was a, a lawyer and a writer and also a creative person who written this play um, that dealt with the bathhouses and coming out to a parent. It's, you know, it's not autobiographical. There were some things that um, mirrored our lives. And I started working on that with animation and a certain kind of text and collages and and um, video. And actually, so speaking of the Museum of City New York, um, they did this exhibition called AIDS at Home Art and Everyday Activism. And they built that show around my work. And they made this room in the center um, where I had this like video piece. And then inside was this animated handwriting audio piece and then these pictures and some of my brother's writings and some of my other photographs I took also medium format uh so it was just incredible to me that you know I could go from this very long career in documentary journalism and then start something new and now the thing I'm working on I'm still working on that because I do want to make a book of it and and I want to expand the collages. Uh, in on March um, 13th, 2019, I went down to help my mother move from a rental apartment into assisted living. And um, obviously that was the day that COVID became a national emergency. And we started moving her that weekend. And then they on Monday, they said nobody can move in. And I was able to get my mother's lease extended, but I had to live with her for three months. She was also diagnosed with cancer that week. And she had to mention it was very, very complicated. And we had a very complicated relationship my whole life. And those three months, I started photographing everything. And I made these different series. Um, some are hanging behind me, but I have it off because they're all crooked right now because I had some in an exhibition, but I did all these still lives and these diptychs and triptychs and I have all this audio of us. And um, 
I have some good news coming, but it's not public yet, so I can't say it. So now I'm able to work on that a bit and hope to do a book with that and exhibition. So, you know, after all those years of photographing other people's lives, I went into my own and my family and and working with archives and um and now I teach at the new school, even though we're actually on strike right now. But I went from starting my project there to teaching students in a very similar way to what I, the way I was taught in that one class. So that was a big full circle for me. Beautiful. Um, yeah, so the twists and turns you know, <laughs> are, are, are happening, are happening all the time. So with that, um, again, I thank you both so much for, for doing this. And um, a standing offer to come back when you, you you get everything else organized and there's another book or another show you want to just present you know we'd love to have you and um we'll see everyone uh everyone have a great thanksgiving <laughs>